What I find a lot of times, and I'm sure you do as well, that when you emerge into something that's new, there have been threads of it throughout your life, right? Mm -hmm. And when I decided to become a clinician and to study well-being and what is it that contributes to individual well-being, I really wanted to throw my net as far as possible. What are indigenous cultures saying about healing? What are other cultures saying about healing? So I did a lot of interning with the Asian counseling and referral program here in Seattle. And my whole goal was really to step outside of sort of a white Eurocentric paradigm to really mm -hmm. try to understand what is the philosophies? What is the knowledge that can help us understand who we are and what it takes for us to thrive. Welcome everyone to another episode of Meta Transitions. Today we have with us Eva Papp. She is coming to us as a counselor, also a business owner, and she's going to be sharing uh, with us, you know, her story um, and I guess how we can transition. So welcome, Eva, to our channel. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and share my story with you. <laughs> yes, definitely. All right. So let's get into it. What is your transition story? Well, I think I've had quite a number of transition stories, but I think the one that is most significant and most recent is um, giving up my practice of 20 years to transition into founding a school for women uh, called the School of De Nova. And that's been pretty significant and I am still in the process of lifting it up. So uh, that's a significant and ongoing transition. Yeah, definitely. I could see how that would be different, right? To be in a career path for 20 years and then now being an owner of a business that's doing something completely different. I would definitely love to hear more about, you know, how that transformation took place. If you had any stories that you can share with us. Oh, totally. Well, you know, I wouldn't say it's actually completely different. And what I find a lot of times, and I'm sure you do as well, that when you emerge into something that's new, there have been threads of it throughout your life, right? Mm -hmm. And when I decided to become a clinician and to study well-being and what is it that contributes to individual well-being, I really wanted to throw my net as far as possible to really take in the ideas, not just of the traditional methodologies of healing, but really what are indigenous cultures saying about healing? What are other cultures saying about healing? And so when I was in my graduate program, I designed an independent study to go study with the shamans in Siberia to really take a look at contextual psychology and what is it about healing that is contributed? What contributes to healing from the environment in the context of an individual's life? And then how much of our healing is subject to that context, right? So you move into a new context and what then happens, right? So I was very curious about these questions. I did a lot of interning with the Asian counseling and referral program here in Seattle. And my whole goal was really to step outside of sort of a white Eurocentric paradigm to really mm -hmm. try to understand who are the contributors? What is the philosophies? What is the knowledge uh, that can help us understand who we are and what it takes for us to thrive? So that's always been through my time as a clinician. And I have always made a big effort to study many different uh, ways of perceiving human beings and what it is that we need. And I was always an eclectic therapist. And so my lifelong quest has been to understand healing in the broadest context. So wow. I think how that relates to my, oh, go ahead. Were you going to say something? I, can start <laughs> I was going to say, wow, you like mind blown. I'm already mind blown already, you know, just sort of hearing you talk about, you know, going beyond sort of that Eurocentric way of educating, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, right. I, I'm even thinking about my own, you know, education experience. And again, being educated here in North America, it's very Eurocentric, right? That's so right. just hearing you talk about, 
you're doing your own through your own curiosity, you know, wanting to find out more about other cultures and other ways of gaining healing uh, is fascinating to me, for sure, because that is definitely what we need in, you know, in our world is to gain a better perspective, especially in the mental health field of mm -hmm. other cultures and being able to identify, okay, how does this person need healing? How can they relate to what healing looks like? And how can we provide this for them? Right? right. And how do we make it specific to the individual we're treating so that we are not putting on, but receiving from and working with, right? It's a completely different perspective. And um, that just seemed extremely important. So in throughout my whole practice, I was always trying to understand because we center healing in this culture so much in psychology, but, you know, other cultures centered in religion or centered in the community or center it in nature. Right? So how do we bring all of that to our clients? So this very broad perspective that could really accommodate whoever walks in the door. So I, um, that's always been my mentality and, about, I guess it was even four years ago, I, you know, and I, a lot of times people step into their transitions because of, a, because of a crisis or something happens that push us, pushes us down a new path. But for me, I was always very happy being a therapist and loved my work with clients. Mm -hmm. But I was also, there was an unsettled piece where I felt like I was supposed to be doing something slightly different. And that part was uneasy, right? Because I kept thinking, what is this? What is this? And so many times we have that feeling, there's something more for me, or there's something bigger or other, or what is it? And, and I'm going to say, particularly women yeah. can push that down. We have so many obligations. We're taking care of family. We're doing this. We're doing that. Right. And we quiet that voice. Right. Sometimes it is that voice that will take us to the transition to that higher place that we need to be or that other place that we actually need to be. But it's not out of duress. It's out of calling for joy or calling for aliveness that we get brought forward into something else. And so really it was that kind of a situation that was sort of calling me to do something different. And I'm sure you're, you've had that in your own work as well. I mean, you want to speak oh, to definitely, that? Definitely, definitely. And, and my husband would say that, you know, um, you have this uneasy, unsettling feeling, you know, when you're going to level up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and that's sort of what I'm hearing from you. You know, you're you mm -hmm. were in this place where you were doing so much right already and you were happy with what you were doing, but you felt like there was more that you were being called to do. Um, and there's that feeling of but there's there's more I need to do, and there's an unsettling, you know, feeling there within that transition. Um, and you it sounds like you found what it, what that was eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I imagine it's a little bit with your work with, you know, your channel and your podcast and, you know, there's this other expression that's being asked of you. Right. Oh, so, yeah. um, you know, so I closed my practice and I thought, well, I really do want to work with women because I have this, I mean, I've always loved my work with men, my clinical work with men for everybody really. But I do feel like there's this time where there's a balancing, there's a great balancing that's starting to happen. And that part of that is the need to have a diversity of voices and women's voices elevated so that there is a balancing out point. And so I just felt it was really important, even though some of the work that I've, I'm doing with my school is really applicable to anybody, that I tailored it to work with women to sort of meet the moment. And that's how it feels to meet the moment. So first I thought, oh, I'm gonna be a coach and work with women who are high level, who if I help them, their capacity to reach many is great mm -hmm. because there was this urgency to reach more than this one-on-one -on -one that I had been doing. Yes. And I guess even at my age and at my stage of 
uh, my own professional development, there is this moment where you develop and transition into wanting to give back in a bigger way, right? So I was responding to some of that. And as I was writing, because I had a blog and I had a website and I was, I started working through these themes. I thought, oh, I'm going to turn this into a little podcast. So I did this like Mm -hmm. little mini podcast. I'm like, oh my God, there's this arc, there's this message here. And Mm -hmm. it it was sort of there in front of me. And I thought, this is an important arc of learning. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that has always been really critical to me, critically important to me is that the skills of therapy, which are essential for everyone, are not exclusive, but that they are widely available to whomever needs them, right? We're service to all, not service to the few who can, right? And so I was thinking to myself, you know, if I could create a curriculum Mm -hmm. of these foundational skills, because I have to tell you, it didn't matter during my 20 years of therapeutic work, high functioning, low functioning, you know, making it big in the world, you know, barely scraping by, women came in with this same set of deficits, skill deficits that kept showing up in the same kinds of ways over and over again. It's like behind sort of this rampant self-doubt that women walk around with, right? And I thought to myself, I am going to put together an arc of learning that really speaks to women discovering their authenticity, Mm -hmm. learning how to act with personal power so they could step out into the world and do that thing that they are here to do. And I call my school the school of De Nova because to me it's, and this is just me, but my languaging of it's the God in one's brilliance, the divinity, the higher calling in one's the thing that one is uniquely gifted to do and brings joy. That's my definition of brilliance, right? And that was what the School of De Nova is about, is sharing that, helping women discover what that is in them so they can follow that to a brilliant life. And, and psychologically ground a knife, not just out there, but one that you know, as you take actions, you develop in joy and purpose and meaning and confidence and, you know, vitality. To me, that is right action, knowing how to do that. So I built this arc and a curriculum around that. And, uh, you know, I, I had my pilot back in January. It was phenomenal. It was just amazing. And so I am now in the section, second section of this, mm-hmm. which is really empowering women therapists Mm -hmm. by supporting them to move into online teaching as a companion to their therapeutic work. Because, you know, we all know one-on-one work, we carry a lot there and, you know, it's intensive and it puts a real ceiling on the kind of money that you can make. And Mm -hmm. talk about a group of people that are like indentured servants starting out, <laughs> right? Yes. Right. Yes. We, we pay the money for the schooling and then all those years to create those hours. It's like, anyway, so this is what I'm doing now with the school is I'm trying to em- empower women therapists by allowing them to use my curriculum to start to get into online teaching as a way of balancing out their time and income constraints, et cetera, et cetera. So Mm -hmm. that's sort of what I'm about. And that's what the school about. And it's very exciting. No, that sounds very exciting. You know, and you're right. I do know what you're talking about when it comes to wanting to expand beyond the one-to-one, right? And, you know, yes, you get very like good, like great joy and reward from helping one client after another. Um, But you're right. There is definitely limitations that come with the one-to-one experience. And that is one of the reasons why I created this channel, because I wanted to reach more people. (laughs) And it's difficult. Right to reach a broader global, um, I guess, population um, with just the one to one, uh, and I, it sounds like that's what you wanted to do too. You wanted to reach a, a wider population of people um, and be able to share this curriculum specifically with women to empower them uh, to, I guess, learn more about themselves and then be able to impart that 
to to others online. No, it's amazing. Definitely. Yes. You know, and I think one of the things, um, Tricia Kay, because, you know, we're talking about when you're not forced into transition, but you feel called into a transition, Mm -hmm. it's a different action, right? Mm -hmm. There's a stepping out in faith, a sense that I'm going to take this step and I don't quite know where it's going to go, but I'm being called to go down this path, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a certain different kind of an urgency and a different kind of a equation for how to move forward. Yeah. You know, you have a lion running after you. That's a one kind of a motivation, right? (laughs) But but you have, you have your dream in front of you. Mm -hmm. That's, it feels so much more optional. Wow, I could just opt out here and go back to whatever I was happy doing before, right? So mm-hmm. how do you keep going forward, right? Mm-hmm. And how do you find that courage to go mm-hmm. forward? So I'm wondering, you have thoughts on that. And I have thoughts to share on that too. Definitely. You know, uh, when it comes to keeping motivation for a dream, it, it takes a lot of inner courage. I would say, right, to be able to keep going because it's difficult, (laughs) you know, especially for individuals that when you start a practice as well, you have no idea if you're going to get clients, you have no idea what's going to happen, but you sort of believe, like you talked about that stepping out on faith, you believe that it's going to work out. So you keep showing up every day and keep doing the things you need to do. Um, But yeah, definitely when you step beyond what you know, right and needing to step into the unknown it's sometimes a different story too and you know I'm sure people will be able to get you know maybe the knowledge that you have of you know maybe sometimes what they might be able to expect or things they can do in that period of time to transition well right and that's what I do in private practice I try to help clients to transition well when they're going through a transition in that uncomfortable Mm -hmm. unknowing waiting (laughs) you know, going towards a goal, right? That's sort of the place where self-care is important, support systems are important, right? Um, And, you know, keeping on task and being mindful and intentional about what you're doing. So those are the things I generally would share with clients. But yeah, I definitely would be interested to find out, you know, what tips maybe you would give to you know clients and again not giving away your program because we want people to go and check you out and totally you know get that training but you know if you could give a few tips then that would be great for you know just the passerby who wants to find out what to do during a transition they're going towards their dreams oh absolutely happy and this is a little tiny tiny section of one unit of a 12 week 12 week unit course. So happy to share. So I always suggest that when one is stepping into unknown territory, that it can be very helpful to sort of take an attitude of a, an excited experiment. Like my life is now going to be uh, an experiment that's exciting. And so once you know you're experimenting it changes the the intensity of it a little bit. Okay, I'm going to like try something out here. And so I always say, so I'm going to read a couple of these things. So you'll see my eyes come over here, but I'm, so the first tip is uncertainty. We'll move to certainty with right action. Just trust the process because, and as we go through in the coursework, that as you take action, you get feedback and that feedback starts to guide you, right? And so even though you might be stepping out with a certain amount of uncertainty, as you begin to move, the path sort of rises up in front of you, right? So to know that even though it feels like, oh my God, I don't know what's happening, that as you take steps, the path will magically appear. So Mm -hmm. just to trust that, okay, it feels uncertain. It's not always going to be this way. Take an action, generate activity, start getting feedback. It will guide you where you need to go. So that's one tip. Another one is don't overcommit to start. 
mm-hmm. you know, trust you're, you're experimenting, right? You're stepping into the no. It's okay to put in a little toe. And in fact, when you're starting out, it's wise to put in a toe, right? Yeah. Because you don't want to go in beyond the data that you have, right? Mm-hmm. So, and even that little toe will give you feedback. Oh, I see. Oh, it wasn't quite that. Oh, it's that, right? So don't overcommit to, to, to start. Tip number three, never risk your bottom line safety. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to throw your life savings into something. Now, some people do, and God bless them. And I'm just saying, if you want to have fun with this and you want to proceed in a longevity way, with sustain. And it's just a tip, but I'm encouraging you to don't risk your bottom line safety. So whatever that might be for you. The next one is to expect mistakes. That that is a natural and important part of the learning trajectory, especially when you're in the unknown. The mistakes are as valuable as, you know, the go ahead lights. And the truth is, if you don't overcommit, the mistakes should never be on such a scale that you're going to get wiped out. So just go slowly, listen, and expect you're going to make mistakes. And so take your steps knowing that some of them will be mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then the other one is live each moment the best you can and love what you live because what you live is the life that you're going to end up having lived. So this is it. So Mm -hmm. even though you're in the unknown and you don't know what's coming or this is it. So enjoy it. Right. And if you're not enjoying it, it's feedback that something can shift and change and it can get better. So if it's too stressful, if it's too disruptive in the rest of your Mm -hmm. life, however you're proceeding, step back, analyze it, adjust right? Because this is it. This is our life. So all of it should be fun, not just when you get the golden ring, right? Um, Another one is each of us has the data we need to create our best life. And if you know that there are no secrets and that when you are at the stage that you're ready, wherever you are, you will get the necessary pieces of information. Are you listening? Are you picking up? Are you so focused that you are missing it? But Mm -hmm. it's all here. So it's like you're not abandoned. It's just you might, your pacing might be slower than you think that you should be going or whatever, but it's all here. And then the last tip is to follow your aliveness. Because if you're following a dream and you're stepping into the unknown, your aliveness, the thing that brings you joy and turns you on and gives you that sense of, Fulfillment is a true path, and it will unerringly take you to more aliveness. And isn't that what we're about and what we follow our dreams for? So those are seven tips that can Mm -hmm. be helpful. Oh, oh, for sure. Like I'm already taking stuff away. And, you know, while you were talking, I was trying to listen, but I've already started, you know, zoning off into my own story, right? And you could tell that, you know, you're such a good teacher, because you're, you're getting me to sort of, you know, think about what you're saying. And it's so amazing, right? And when you talked about sort of that idea of knowing yourself, and, you know, walking into your true joy, and um, living, you know, your life, right now even though it's transitioning and changing you know they can still be joy and peace in you know what you're doing currently in that change right Um, and it just reminded me of my own sort of story and how I got to be where I am today you know and you're right your, your life story does you know if you are paying attention to it and listening to it it does lead you down a path that helps you you know to identify why you're here Um, and why you're doing what you need to do. So, you know, sometimes it could be thinking about, okay, what is my life story? How did I get here? And that could also help you to identify where you want to go. Yeah. And, and, you know, to be fair, this sort of is, I think this is already chapter eight or something. And we been in the course, the first chunk learning how to build right action, which is action that really is specific to the situation 
that you're in, but reflects who you are now and who you want to be. And so when one learns how to take action, given our experiences and who we are, like what's happening now, what's happened in the past, how to bring all of that together so that we have the ability to create actions that not only respond to the environment, but to who we truly are. Once we get that nailed down, then we can step forward into the unknown because we know how to take right action that's going to help us avoid some of these pitfalls that come up when we're taking action, you know, and maybe following a wrong dream or whatever. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it sounds simple, but the the following through on some of these things can be require a certain level of already self-knowledge and intimacy with the self and ability to direct the self. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, Mm -hmm, definitely. And I could see how your course would be amazing, you know, for insight, for learning about yourself, for then, you know, that foundation, you know, to then be able to execute on the dream that you want to execute on. So yeah. yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad I had you here and thank you for sharing, you know, about yourself, your story and oh, yeah. and your course. So, you know, I think one of the key pieces is to and and when I mentioned this already is, you know, empowering other women therapists to use this curriculum to reach the people that they are niched out with. Because if we're all doing our good work, our work is going to be unique because we're unique and our communities are unique and the way we speak to our communities and the needs of our communities are unique. And so part of this framework I built is something that clinicians can find themselves in and then you know, once they're really adept at the curriculum, build out parts that speak to their community. Because the idea is that it's a tool for clinicians also to use to reach people who may not otherwise have access or be open to therapy because it's, you know, the wrong paradigm for them, right? But if you have the right voice Mm -hmm. translating this work, then I, I believe this material uh, could be helpful to wide spectrum of women. And, you know, maybe someday one of these clinicians is going to make a material for men or kids or whatever, you know, it's, that's, it's built to be responsive to whoever it's meant to serve. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So I I appreciate you again for coming and for sharing this. Uh, And I know that, you know, hopefully women that are watching, you know, will seek out Eva and her services Um, because this is necessary for, you know, uh, us as clinicians, especially, you know, again, serving the population of women um, to gain a better understanding of who you are and using those past experiences to guide, you know, uh, your niche and and, and the clients that would be best served through your experience. Yeah, that's what I'm getting from that. Yeah. All right. So, Uh, Eva, if you could share with the audience how they can contact you if they want to learn more about your program. Yeah, um, I think my website really is the simplest way to really get a sense of what's going on. And it's just my name, www.evapap.com. And, you know, you can always contact me directly. I'm always open and I love talking with individuals. Um, so I think that that's the best way. And I also am pretty active on Instagram. In fact, that's where we met. Um, yes. So it, one can always follow me there as well, too. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Eva, for joining us. And, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll do this again soon. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, I will be putting Eva's contact information in the description box below. Please go and check out her program if you want to gain a better understanding of who you are as a clinician and, you know, to reach that specific niche that only you can reach. All right. On to next time. Take care.